to that place where you sent your son Jesus to die on the cross for our sins, for my sins, for all of our sins, Father. Thank you for that. We just praise you and we give you the glory in Jesus' name. Amen. You may be seated. Thank you, Kevin, and the worship team. So last week, we spent some time talking about, out of Ephesians chapter 5, this idea of purity and how we're called to purity. And and we look at the scripture and we we contrast this idea as as followers of Christ, we see it clearly that we are called to, to love. And, and that's abundantly clear. And we, dif- we have difficult time looking at this idea of our call to love and this, this, still this call to righteousness. And we get hung up sometimes that this call to righteousness is this call to legalism. In other words, I have to do all these right things to be accepted. And, and so we battled with that a little bit. And we, we concluded that there's this reality that we are, in fact, uh, called to do the right things. We are called to purity. That purity is important. And with that, we came to this realization that we can't do that on our own. I mean, I, I really, I'm, I'm stuck. If I'm going to rely on myself and my self-righteousness, I'm going to find myself at a dead-end road because I can't do all that it takes. And that's where we've, we talked about this grace, that even in the midst of this. And so then we talked about how our lives, basically, as we're moving through life, we leave behind us a wake. And in our wake, it should show evidence of where it is that we've been and what it is that we're doing, where it is that we're going, and who it is that we're following. And so as we live our life, we talked about what's, what's being left in our wake. Is it evidence that points to Christ? And so that we're going to continue on with that today, and we're going to get more specific. We're going to get into some passages that you're going to perhaps hate, and you're going to get into some passages. What, what we're going to find is we're going to find that there's going to be two, two scenarios or two sections that we're hit here. At one point, we're going to hear these words that wives are to submit to their husbands, and the husbands will be going, yes. It's about time someone says that from the pulpit. And then we're going to go on, we're going to read a little bit farther, and we're going to find that, oh man, then it says that uh, husbands are to love their wives, and the wives are going to go, yeah, yeah, you see, it's about time that we, we see that, about time that we hear that. And so we, it's very easy, and sometimes we look at these verses, and we want to kind of maybe point back and forth to each other, they're not doing this, he's not doing this, etc. But I know that what we're dealing with is talking about marriage, But what I want you to grasp and see, even before we get into that, is that really what this verse, what this passage is about, the section out of Ephesians chapter 5, verses 21 through 33, I think it is, it's really about Christ. 
Okay, you have to look at a little bit, a little bit beyond what you just read there, because this whole book of Ephesians is about Jesus. And I know it seems like, well, of course it's about Jesus because it's it's in the Bible. But I want you to really look at it's designed to be this reflection back to Christ and who Christ is. So last week we talked about. I think I'm not. No, I'm not. We talked about where we were. Do I have batteries in this thing? Okay, good. Just checking. There we go. So we talked about this idea of the wake. Okay? And so what we have here is we have a body of water and we have something moving that is creating a wake. We can't see what's causing it. Right? But the evidence is there that something has just gone by. And if I'm going to use my deductive reasoning, I'm going to be saying pretty sure that, that there's a boat. Now, I may not know exactly what kind of boat has just gone by, but a boat has gone by and it has left that wake. So in other words, as the boat goes by, I should be able to somewhat identify what has just gone by but what is seen, by what is seen in the water. Okay? You following with me? So as a follower of Christ, as I go by and I leave this wake, if you will, this idea of, of purity and love that should both be left behind where I go, it should point back to who it is that I'm following. All right. And so now I want to add a couple pieces in here, because as we look at, at this next section, we see not only marriage, but we go farther and we see children. And so what we see is there's pieces of this wake, and there's other people that exist in it. And so here's a picture of me when I was wakeboarding one time. <laughs> yeah, this, they put me on the cover of Wakeboard Magazine. Don't know if the magazine exists, but look at that. Isn't that something? I mean, seriously, that, that's pretty good. You know, I, I, honestly, I've, I've only wakeboarded once, and if you want to call it wakeboarding, I was up for a very short period of time. I did a lot of water skiing as a kid, and the thing with wakeboarding is, you know, you're, you're, you're sideways, and I just never, never got that, all right? I could never figure that out. I got up one time, very briefly, I spent more time in the water trying to get up than I did getting up by far. I mean, it was like 45 minutes before I even got onto the surface of the water. But it's interesting, so what you have here, obviously, this guy here is leaving a wake, you know, behind him, even on this wakeboard, he is leaving some evidence that he has just gone by. And he's being pulled by this boat. And so what we see, and I want to, and, and I don't think I'm stretching it here too much, but I love this picture that I came across. So envision this now. You have this boat that is moving in a direction, and it's leaving this wake. It's leaving this idea of, of love and righteousness behind. And yet with that wake then is being pulled people. You know, so as a follower of Christ and the church, in a sense, because the church really is part of this idea. We looked at it last week, this idea of purity. Well, as an individual, we, there's something broader. And we can look at the idea of the church moving in a direction that leaves its wake of love and righteousness. And then you have the people that are part of the church also as individuals leaving this wake. You know, and it, it should kind of align. It should follow. It should follow that same direction. So where Christ goes, then the church would then go, leaving that pattern of love and of righteousness. And then likewise, the, the, the church would go too. But I see this. We talked about this idea of the church caring and caring for one another. This is a beautiful picture of leading people, helping people along with you as you leave the wake. Here you have, I assume, a father and son. You know, what a great picture of how the church ought to be moving in the direction of Christ. And so that's what we're going to be talking about more here this morning is this idea of the wake. And so as we get started, this is what we got. Ephesians chapter 5, verse 21. When we look at this section of Scripture, because this is before we get into the whole wives submit to your husbands type thing, this is a huge verse. This is, this is a very, very key and important verse that we start off with. Because if you're, most of your Bibles, if you're looking at your Bible, it's probably laid out where it's starting at verse 22, you see basically instructions for husbands and wives or something along that, that, that title, that subtitle in there. And it starts at verse 22. However, verse 21 is so key because it's going to tie in what we talked about last week with what we're going to talk about this week. And so as we get into it, look at at Ephesians 5, starting at verse 15. We're going to, just, we're going to flow into this here. It says, be careful then. This is Paul writing to the church in Ephesus and other churches nearby. Be careful how you live. Don't be unwise, but be wise. Making the most of every opportunity. Again, look at this and think of, it's not pointing to individuals. This is pointing back to Christ. Make every attempt, okay? Take advantage of every opportunity that you're given. Why? Is it for yourself? It's not. It's for this idea of take every opportunity that you have to leave evidence of Christ and what Christ has done. 
Therefore, do not be foolish, verse 17, but understand what the Lord's will is. Do not get drunk on wine, which leads to debauchery. Instead, be filled with the Spirit. Again, what are we looking at? Why do we not get drunk on wine? Because that doesn't point to Christ. It's saying the opposite then. If you don't, we should live our lives in such a way that it points to Christ. Okay? Instead, be filled with the Spirit because that points to Christ. Speak to one another. I love this. Speak to one another with psalms, hymns, and spiritual songs. Why? Because when we treat each other that way, it points to Christ. Sing and make music in your heart to the Lord. Always give thanks to God the Father for everything in the name of our Lord and Jesus. Why? Because it points to Christ. Now look at verse 21. Submit to one another out of reverence to Christ. This is how this passage is going to start. It talks about this submission. And this is not, people hear this word submit, like we're about ready to get into in verse 22. I'm just trying to prepare you so when I get into verse 22, I don't have a bunch of women upset with me. Okay? That's all I'm just trying to do, trying to save my bacon, if you will. Okay? So what we look at is, is this idea of submit. People get volatile and angry with this idea of submit. Sarah and I do a lot of premarital counseling. Uh, when we have, whenever we perform a ceremony, we, we require that they go through premarital counseling. This is one topic that we always hit. We talk about it because it's important. And when we look at this idea of submit, we say, like, who, whoa, whoa, I'm not going to submit to anyone especially my husband, all right? But you look at this passage, and it's a bigger call first and foremost. It says, submit to one another out of reverence to Christ. So I submit to you, and you submit to me, and this, it's this body functioning. Chris was talking about that a number of weeks ago, how the hands have a job, and the hands do the work that they are supposed to do. They're functioning. They have a role to play. And so when those hands function, it's this idea of submitting to one another as part of the body of Christ. And here we have it again in verse 21, submit then to one another. So we're all called to submit, just first and foremost. Just so we, just so we clear the air. Is everyone comfortable now? Okay. I'm a little bit apprehensive. Okay. And so here we have then verse 22. And it says, wives, submit yourselves to your own husbands as to the Lord. What we're going to deal with is this is one of the most powerful images that we have that points back to God. Okay, this section of scripture, it paints this idea, this picture of what it looks like between Christ and his church. And so we have to keep looking at this as this parallel between Christ and this church. Because when a wife submits to her husband, it's intended that it would point back to Christ. That's why she submits to her husband. It's not a legalism type thing. It's not an old-fashioned type thing. But she chooses to submit to her husband because it points back to Christ. And what we, what we find is that as we go on here, we're going to see how husbands are supposed to love their wives. And husbands ought to love their wives because it points back to Christ. And if we went farther into chapter 6, we'd see children are supposed to obey their parents. We talked about that a little bit last week, too. Why are children supposed to obey their parents? Because, again, it points back to Christ. So this is all about Jesus. Everything we're talking about this morning is intended as the body of Christ to be able to point back to him. So I want you to grasp that this morning. I want you to see it. I want you to own it. I want you to understand where it is that we're going with it. And, and it's so important because we look at marriages, and I recognize not everyone is married here. My children are not yet married. You've got a long ways to go. 32 is the marriaging age. Uh, but not everyone is married. But this still applies because there's several ways that it can apply. If you're here and you're single, let's say you've never been married, this still applies because you had parents... Okay, mother, father, whether it was a marriage relationship, you can, you've seen good, you've seen bad, you've seen how marriages can point to Christ, you've seen perhaps how marriages do not point to Christ. And so you know that when you look at the scriptures, you can use your life experiences that you have engaged, and you, you can say, all right, you know, man, that was a tough childhood I lived in. But I can see how that marriage was not what God intended. Or it can be the opposite. Maybe you're single, you've never been married, you don't know if you ever will get married, but you can still look at your parents and say, you know, I can use my parents' testimony to point people to Christ. You know, so we, we can relate to it, is what I'm saying. So if you're married or not married, if you're married and your spouse has passed away, this is still relatable because you have a story that goes along with that, that you can say, 
Let me tell you about the marriage that I had before my wife or my husband passed. Because again, this is the picture. We see this in scripture. We talk about uh, God. We talked about it with, with Israel, how there was this marriage relationship with God and with Israel, how we are the bride of Christ. And so marriage is huge. And marriage is under attack in this culture and in this country. And I'm convinced that it's attacked, particularly in our Christian realms, in our Christian circles right now, because Satan wants to get into our marriages and he wants to destroy them because marriage is one of the best pictures that we have to testify to who Jesus Christ is. And it's marriages, and it's amazing, and it's beautiful. It's very difficult sometimes to live with me. So with this powerful image, I think we need to look at this idea of marriage, and we need to take it seriously to the point of, all right, if, this mar- if marriage is something that's going to point back to Christ, how, how is that going to happen? You know, when we look at, at grace, I want to emphasize this aspect too, because there's, there's people that I know marriage is, marriage is hard. And there's, there's some who, you know, divorce, God allows divorce. We see that in the scriptures. But that doesn't mean that a marriage now still can't point to, to Christ, okay? And that doesn't mean that we, we can't have past experiences, even painful and broken experiences, broken marriages, that somehow say, you know, that's not what God wanted. Let me tell you what God does want. Let me tell you what does point to Christ, you know, so I realize that we're, we're dealing with a very volatile subject, very painful subject, maybe for some. But I want to emphasize, there's a story in the scriptures, the Old Testament, a man by the name of Hosea. He was a prophet of God. And he was told by God to go marry this woman. Her name was Gomer. I know. He's, I know. It's like so unfortunate. So he was told to go marry Gomer. And Gomer was a prostitute. And so Hosea obeys the Lord, and he goes and he marries Gomer. And countless times, over and over again, after this marriage, Gomer continues to um, be adulterous to Hosea. She continues to have these adulterous relationships. And yet, what we find is that Hosea, according to the Lord's leading, accepts her back. And embrace it, brings forgiveness. That is a picture of God and his people. And if you're battling with a, with a very difficult marriage, I want this to be something like, okay, you know, my spouse has been adulterous. My spouse is just, I can't, I can't do it. I can't live with it. I understand that there's, there's great pain there. And so I'm not making dogmatic statements, but we have to at least look at what can point people to Christ. Because in this situation with, with Hosea and Gomer, it pointed the nation of Israel back to God. That's why God called Hosea to do it. That was the result of it, where God said, Hosea, I need you to do this. And then he said, just as Hosea took back Gomer, so have I taken back Israel. And it was time and time again. And so when we understand some of these things, these important aspects of of marriage, perhaps then we can look at these words like submit and not feel quite so volatile when we see it and when we hear it. So it says, wives, submit yourselves to your own husbands as you do to the Lord. All right? And then this next verse goes super, super well with it, obviously. For the husband is the head of the wife. Why will people have a problem with that? Okay? We'll deal with that in just a second. So the, for the husband is head of the wife, as Christ is the head of the church, his body of which he is a savior. So grasp this, okay? I know we look at this head as like he's controller, he's ruler. But we forget this reality that the head is attached to the body. If you take the head off the body, the body's dead. Okay? You catch that? That is, that is huge, because the implications here is then, so if we look at this, for a husband is the head of the wife, as, all right, here's our parallel, as Christ is the head of the church. So if we take Christ and we cut off the head of the church, which is Christ, and we sever that tie, we sever that bond, the church is dead. I mean, that's, that's just the way it is. You can't have the church without Christ as being the head. And so we have to understand as we look at marriage, as we look at life, as we look at followers of Christ, we have a role to play in it. And we may not necessarily like our role, but we have to understand that our role is for a purpose, and that purpose is not necessarily for us. Our purpose is to point back to Christ. That is so important. 
So for the husband is head of the wife. Now this, when we look at, at the, the epistles in particular, okay, these letters that these disciples and apostles have written, when understanding them, it's important to, when, when you're going to try to understand, okay, what does the head mean? You look back into the same letter. All right, so Paul has written this letter to this area, this church, and he uses this phrase elsewhere in the letter. And so let's take a look. So in Ephesians chapter 1, verse 22, so, and God placed all things under his feet, his being Christ here, placed all things under his feet. Remember, that's when he gave that all to us. He gave Christ everything, and then Christ gives it to us. So undeserving, but so amazing. And he appointed him, this is Christ, he appointed Christ to be head over everything for the church. Okay? which is his body, the fullness. You see that, that tie between the head and the body, the fullness of him who fills everything in every way. They're connected. They're bonded. You cannot separate them and expect to still have life. Instead also, this is verse, uh, Ephesians chapter 4, verse 15. Instead also, speaking the truth in love, we will grow. This is the idea of the body growing to become in every respect the mature body of him, the mature body of him who is connected to the head, that is Jesus Christ. And so that's huge. That's important. And I know, okay, maybe we're dealing with some things I don't want to submit to my husband. Okay? I don't want him to be the head of me because I see how he treats me. I see how he treats others. And we'll, we'll touch briefly on that in a little bit. But it says now, now as the church submits to Christ, so also wives should submit to their husbands in everything. And we've had in everything, really? Well, here's the, the reality. And this is where I want you to grasp this because I'm not making the, the super broad dogmatic statement on this because it says, as a church submits to Christ, so also wives should submit to their husbands in everything. You got to understand, Jesus Christ is not going to lead the church astray. And so we are safe as the church to submit to Christ because he is not going to lead us astray. And if the purpose of marriage and the purpose of following Christ and submitting is intended to point to Christ, then it ought to point to Christ. Now, if my husband or wife, say that for yourselves, not just, <laughs> if my spouse, we'll say it that way, how about that? If my spouse tries to lead me, you know, for wives would be husband, tries to lead me astray and saying, oh, you need to do this. Okay, should I, if it's going to point to Christ, if I follow? Oh, man, that's not. Then we need to take a look at that, okay, so that we're not led astray. But that being said, you've got to look at this. How can your life, your submission, point to Christ? Women, if you're, if you're being, you know, abused, you know, there's, there's laws against that. And, and I believe that these are, are Christ um, approved, if you would. I believe that Christ approves of the laws that we have where women ought not to be abused. And so if women are being abused, I feel like that's going against what Christ would want. And perhaps we need to be able to say, you know, I need help in this relationship. And so we would call and get help in this relationship, even if it happens to be the police. I'm not asking wives who are being abused to continue to stay in a relationship like that under those circumstances. You follow? But this idea, how can your submission, how can our life point to Christ and point people to Christ? And so we look at this like, man, that's, that's, that's hard to do. And the guys are thinking, well, my wife maybe needs to learn a little bit of this idea of submission. Well, it gets more difficult for the husbands here because it's interesting. There's three verses that talk to the wives. There's nine verses that talk to the husbands. Okay? I know. That's why all the women are going, yeah, that's right. You better pay attention. Elbows are starting to fly. So catch what this says now. And we oftentimes, we shut this down right here and not really comprehend or fully grasp what, what the deal is here because there's something huge. This is important. I know all the women are like, well, we better hit them hard right now. But husbands, love your wives just as Christ loved the church and gave himself up for her. So we see this and we kind of shut it off right there. Well, husbands love your wives. So wives are supposed to submit to their husbands. In other words, we think that wives are supposed to do everything their husbands do and all husbands really have to do is just love their wives. This is huge. Okay, you got to see this. Because what the, what the verse says is, husbands love your wives. Doesn't, it's not a period. It's a comma. Just as, so there's something to compare it to, just as Christ loved the church and gave himself up for him. 
Okay, that changes everything, because if you know the story of what Jesus Christ did for the church, that changes everything. You know, men, we're pretty adventurous. You know, so we look at this like, yes, I, I could love my wife just as Christ loved the church because Jesus Christ died for the church. I could die for my wife. We're all happy I could take a bullet. I think most men, if we asked, all right, would you die for your wife? You betcha I would. You know, if you put her at gunpoint, I would jump right in front, I would, I would take the bullet. We would do it, right? Because that's, that's, that's bold, that's adventuresome. Well, would you, would, you, would you watch a chick flick with them? What? Seriously? Ugh. Would you, would you do the dishes? Seriously? I mean, is that really part of it? But you got to understand what this verse is saying is husbands are supposed to love their wives just the same way that Christ loved the church. Well, Christ gave himself, gave up everything. In Philippians uh, chapter 2, I'm going to read that for you. Philippians chapter 2, starting at verse 5, it says this. Your attitude should be the same as that of Christ Jesus, who being in the very nature of God, did not consider equality with God something to be grasped. But get this, verse 7, but he made himself nothing. Taking the very nature of a servant, being made in human likeness, and being found in appearance as a man, he humbled himself and became obedient to death, even death on a cross. You know, so husbands, we, we look at this idea of wives, they ought to submit to us. We have a much bigger call. Because when it says, husbands, you ought to love your wives, just as Christ loved the church, he's calling you to submit. Because that's exactly what Jesus Christ did. He submitted. Jesus Christ did not need to submit to us. He had no, nothing to tie him except for the fact that he loved us such, in such a way that he was willing to give everything up for us. And we are now called to love our wives in the same way. And yes, that might mean that we have to watch some chick flicks. It might mean that we have to wash some dishes. It might mean, here, catch this, you know, we would take a bullet for our wife, but as soon as our wife says, you know, we say, well, what do we want to do tonight? We're thinking, man, let's, let's watch football or let's, let's watch uh, an action movie or whatever the case is. And our wife says something to us. They say, I just thought we could sit and talk. Huh? <laughs> you know what I mean? I thought, oh, it's fascinating how we love our wives and we want to love our wives in such a way and we would take a bullet for them and yet when we get into this idea of, all right, really, would you die to yourself in such a way that you would meet the needs of your wife who wants to connect with you in that emotional way? And that's where we fail, gentlemen. Myself is included in that number. That's where we fail because that seems harder than taking a bullet some days. You know what I mean? But yet, if we're going to love our wives as Christ loved the church, we give up everything for them. And here's this idea. We have this role as men. If we're going to call ourselves a follower of Christ, we have a role. And this is a huge responsibility. We're only on verse number two for the guys, and already it's gotten heavy. To make her holy. This is what, you know, these go really closely together here. So grasp what's going on here, because what we see is, this is what Christ did for the church, and then he's going to flip it, and he's going to call us men to do the same thing for our wives. So husbands, love your wives just as Christ loved the church and gave himself up for her to make her holy. So Christ was to make the church holy, and we're going to be called to do the same thing, cleansing her by the washing with water and through the word. We have a responsibility, gentlemen, to help our wives be holy. And that is not saying, all right, you're doing this wrong, you're doing this wrong, you're doing this wrong. It's not that idea of legalism, you know, and righteousness where we force it on them like we talked a little bit about last week. This is the idea of nurturing and cherishing our wives in such a way that we care so much about them that we want to lead them towards holiness. That's, that's difficult. That's hard. That's huge to be able to do. And what that means is I may have to actually take my Bible and I may have to open it up and say, all right, let's look at this together. Let's see what God has for us in this family. Let's see what God has for you and I as we look at the word together. And to present her, this is Christ, to present her, the church, to himself as a radiant church. I remember the day I got married. I've shared this before, I know. When Sarah came down the aisle, I bawled like a baby. I mean, I just was overwhelmed, overwhelmed with this gift that had been given to me. Radiance is not 
a strong enough word for what I was experiencing at that moment. And so as this bride is coming down, that is how the church has been prepared for Christ, and that is how I ought to treat my wife in such a way as that first moment and that radiance as she was coming down the aisle. It's that idea of love and cherish. It's interesting, Tommy Nelson, uh, he's, he's got a series and he's got, done some writing, but he's done a lot of studying in the book of Song of Solomon. That's interesting. But in the book of Song of Solomon, he emphasizes basically that a woman's greatest need is to be cherished, and a man's greatest need is to be respected. And you see both of those exist in this passage in Ephesians. He uses Song of Solomon to point it out. I think we see it here as well in the book of Ephesians, where this is a huge idea of of cherishing. And to present her to himself as a radiant church without stain or wrinkle or any other blemish, but holy and blameless. In the same way, here it is, this is where he throws it back on us guys. In the same way, husbands ought to love their wives as their own bodies. Remember, they're attached. If you separate the head from the body, it leads to death. He who loves his wife loves himself. This is a huge call. You got to understand, and I know it's difficult to look at this, but you have to understand that wives, when you submit to your husbands because you're wanting to submit to, to Christ, that points people to Christ. I've known many godly marriages where you have a very gentle spirit in a woman and she pours out herself and submits and submits, and you see Christ in the relationship. And likewise, you see a husband who knows how to really love his wife. It points to Christ in the relationship. It's not men strong-arming their way. It's men learning how to submit in a different way than what women are called to, perhaps. But you see this mutual submission. Remember what verse 21 was? Submit yourselves to one another. It's not just one-sided. After all, no one ever hated their own body but they fed and care for their body, just as Christ does the church. As Christ takes care of the church and provides for the church, men are designed and created with that role in mind. Our job is to, yes, provide. We can't throw, just throw a slab of meat on the table and say, there, cook it. But it's this idea of caring for much more than just providing food on the table. But it's, 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 it's this idea of creating in them this holiness and building up our wives for we are members of his body. For this reason, a man will leave his father and mother. This is quoted from Genesis. A man will leave his father and mother and be united with his wife, and the two will become one flesh. This is that idea, okay? The two will become one flesh. You have two parts. They come together. It's a great mystery. We're going to see that in just a second. But you have a husband and wife. The wife submits to her husband. The husband submits to his wife. And you have this amazing connection. And if there's going to be separation, there's going to be damage. Okay? They have so bonded together where flesh has become flesh, cells have bonded together and joined together, that if they're going to be separated, you guys got to understand there's going to be damage. I cannot separate the two unless I cut them. I can't just say, oh, that one belonged to him, that belonged to her. It can't happen. And so as soon as that comes apart, and that's, what's, that's what the enemy wants to do, he wants to tear it down, he wants to damage the idea of marriage and the relationship. But the two have become one flesh. And that points to Christ because Christ is the head of the church and you have the same connection, the same unity. We saw before Paul talked about it, the idea of the mystery. It's a great mystery what Christ has done. Here we see it again. This is a profound mystery, but I'm not talking about Christ, but I am talking about Christ in the church. However, each one of you must also love his wife as he loves himself and the wife must respect, there's that word respect, her husband. It's, it's so important. I'm not sure how I, I want to wrap up here. I feel like it's been a fairly, fairly heavy topic. But when we go back and we look at the idea of the wake that we're leaving, marriage is it's evident. It's out there. People see how you interact with your wives. Guys, if you're out with your friends, you ought not to be criticizing your wife. That does not point back to Christ. Wives, when you're out with the ladies, you ought not to be criticizing your husband because that is not pointing back to Christ. If you're single, you can use the relationships that you know, but even your, your parents, relationships you've been in, and be able to talk about this idea, how does marriage 
point back to Christ. This is important. This is huge. So if, if, if you're married here, you need to take some time and you need to reflect on this. Is our marriage pointing people to Christ? Are we leaving in our wake something that can say yes? There was a story I came across, and this, this is a little bit challenging. And I wish I remember the details better. It was one of those things where you just kind of read through it. But it stuck with me as I was continuing to prepare this week. There's a story of, it was a Japanese woman that was sharing it. And she overheard this conversation in a cafe. And the question at the cafe was something along the lines of, you know, what do you do when you have, I think in this case it was a wife, who, who was being abused in the relationship? You know, maybe with verbal, non-believing husband. And the question was, what, what, what should I do? And this woman who was not associated with the conversation said, can I answer that question just out of the blue? And the guy said, well, okay, go, go ahead. And she told this story about five women in her home country of Japan. And she basically said, these five women were believers in Christ, but all five of them were married to a non-believer. And it was extremely challenging. It was extremely difficult, to put it mildly. But they continued, she said, her words were something along the lines of, they continued to love their husbands and submit to their husbands as an act of submission to Christ. You know, so they're serving the Lord through this, this role. And each one of those men eventually chose to follow Christ through the testimony of the wife. And I'm not saying it's going to happen that way all the time. I don't know that, but in this case, it, it did. And then she said that one of, those, one of those men was my dad. And so that's how she knew the story. But look at how that points back to Christ. So you need to take some time and reflect on your marriage. Take some time to reflect on, on your relationship and be able to ask the question, is my way that I'm loving my wife, is it pointing people to Christ? Is the way that I am submitting to my husband, is it pointing to Christ? Is our marriage pointing to Christ? And if it's not, how can we change that to be able to have that relationship point back to Christ? Because the passage that we just read, it's not about husbands and wives as much as it's about Christ and his church. And we are bonded with him in that same way. And that's amazing. Let me pray. Kevin, when you come. Um, I feel like I left it heavy Oh, well, I don't, know, I don't know what else to say about that. But I do want to emphasize there's grace. And so if you're feeling like this is, this is heavy, there's grace. Okay, I don't know what, what the battles are. I don't know what the brokenness is, but there's grace. And even in, in the times where it's like, okay, man, I've just really messed things up. I look back on that. I just, I, I'm living. There's grace to be able to say, you know, God's going to take your life, he's going to take your experiences, and he can and desires to help you take your experiences and point back to Christ even now. All right? So we're, that's, that's the beauty of Christ and his grace. We all have hope because he's given us grace over and over and over again. Just as Hosea gave Gomer that grace and the forgiveness, we always have the grace from Christ over and over again. Let me pray, and then Kevin and the worship team are going to lead us. Father, I give you thanks. I know this is difficult uh, passages of scripture. And I just pray that your spirit will do something right now that you will do a work in our hearts that me as men and as husbands we can learn and know how to love our wives that points people back to you. And wives, they can learn how to love and submit to their husbands that again can, can point back to you because this passage is all about you. Help us to see that this morning. In Jesus' name, amen.
So may you come to see that your marriages are created and designed to point back to Christ. And may you learn to see and understand what that idea, what God has called us to, and how we submit to one another, how wives can submit to their husbands and point to Christ, and husbands, you can love your wives in such a way that it points to Christ. That's what he's calling us to do. So let me pray. Father, give you thanks for what it is that you've called us, for the roles that you have called us to, and I just pray that your spirit will move on us in such a way that we can take what it is that we've heard, we can apply it to our lives and to our relationships, and for husbands and wives to our marriages that we can see marriages succeed in this culture, and that that can be a testimony to you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Please stay for pie. I think Joetta has it set up over yonder. It'd be wonderful. Delicious.